All right, we're going to get started. So we have the full time tonight. I know more will be trickling in here. Uh, there's still stuff in their faces back there. Um, but let me go through all of our announcements for tonight. So if you're not here on Sunday, Cody and Tara Clark had their baby. And so Elliot and Lawson are excited to have a new little baby brother, Bennett. And so we're rejoicing with them. If you didn't see tonight, Susanna's got the baby here for the first time. So Kara's here tonight. So that's really exciting too. Kevin's uncle Benny had a uh, bypass surgery and his wife Janet's caring for him and they request prayers for him. Shelly uh, has been getting great news about her cancer and so we're thankful for that. Fred Barnes requested that everyone pray for his hip surgery and ask for continued prayers for his recovery. And this isn't here, but I think he had hip surgery and it like something's not right with it and so this is a redo or something like that, which sounds awful. You go through it once and you have to have it again. Charles Bradley underwent a heart cath and is waiting on treatment options. And what I understand happened was they, I, th I think, this is my best understanding, so someone correct me if I'm wrong, but they were doing the heart cath. They wanted to do stents, but the, the doctor was not sure whether the best thing was stents or open heart. And so I think he finished up the cath and is consulting with some other doctors, and they're going to decide whether to stent or do something more dramatic. But he does have pretty significant blockage and something will have to happen. So that's Charles Bradley. A friend of the DeCrows is undergoing treatment for esophageal cancer. Kathy underwent a procedure to check and see if she had a recurrence of cancer and you're cancer free, got a great report and she's here tonight. So we're thankful for that. We heard today that Greg Grinder had a massive stroke, and uh, he is in the hospital in Little Rock. I heard that it, you know, was pretty serious, and he was unable to respond yesterday. But I, Kathy Wright shared with me that he was at least able to say a few things today. So we're hoping that there's some progress there. Uh, I've been texting some with Denise, but I don't have any more details to share. Calvin Harris, little four-year-old Calvin, is continuing his cancer treatments at St. Jude. Gail Br Bradley's nephew is losing his battle with cancer, and his caregiver is Gail's sister, Sandra, and they just pray for that situation. Um, Ricky, uh, yeah, and his name is Ricky Hodges. Wayne Hewlin underwent surgery on melanoma on his face and is undergoing, uh, waiting on test results. Then we have several people we regularly pray for, um, James and Edith Jones, the Knights and Shep. Diane's still recovering with her broken uh, arm. Dana Pedigo is recovering from her sp spine fractures. Vincent Ann Scalzo, Hattie Shell, Zach Wilson. Um, Alechi Madu is, she went through a procedure this past Monday and she is here tonight, so she's doing well, but that was one of the preparations she's got to do for her major bone marrow transplant that's coming up, I think, in July. And so we just want to be praying for that whole process. Charles Petrie is bedridden right now in pain, waiting to see a doctor to hopefully get some relief from his back pain. And Bob and Betty Ward both need our, our, our prayers for strength. Uh, Betty's Parkinson's disease is getting pretty bad, and so we need to be praying for, for Bob and Betty. I think that's all the prayer requests that I have. Uh, this Saturday is Opal Deez's 90th birthday, and we'll be celebrating it on Saturday, May 7th from 2 to 4 here at the church building. Our high school graduates are Alechi Madu and Anna Wright, and we will have a celebration for them on Sunday, May 15th. There will be baskets in the foyer that you can put cards and gifts the Perigold Children's Home Truck will be here on Monday, May 16th, and you can find a list of items for that uh, in the bulletin or the weekly email. That's all that I had. So let's say a prayer so Phil can have the rest of the time tonight. Our Father, we thank you for um, your love. We're thankful for this church. We're thankful for this group of people that you have brought together. And tonight as we've listed all these names with all these very serious situations and heartbreak and tears that are happening. We pray that you fill them with hope that comes through Jesus Christ. We pray that your spirit gives them the grace that they need to sustain. We pray that your power is made manifest in weakness. And especially in the situations that we mentioned tonight involving little children, we pray for healing. We pray for 
their ability to be cancer free and to live lives and their families and to grow in faithfulness to you. And so we lift up everyone that we've mentioned tonight. We rejoice with our sister Opal and her upcoming birthday. We rejoice in the graduates, Alechi and Anna, and this special time in their lives. And we just pray for your hand of blessing to be all on them. We're thankful that Kara is here with us tonight, and we pray a blessing on Kara and her parents. We're just so thankful for the, the healthy birth of baby Bennett and the Clarks. And we pray that you'd be with Hunter and with Caroline as they approach the day that they'll be having their baby and we're just so blessed with all these little new children here we just pray for a blessing over them we pray for phil as he speaks to us tonight that you'll bless him and that his presentation tonight will be a blessing to us and we pray all this in jesus name amen just by way of very brief introduction larry mckenzie is with us tonight i think in his own words he bummed a ride tonight to be here with phil and support him and so it's great to have Larry with us and then we have Dr. Phil Slate with us and Phil has been a longtime Memphian he's been around here he's preached for a number of years he was a dean at what is now the Harding School of Theology I think it was the graduate school uh, when he was the dean for six years he has a doctorate of missiology so the study of missions from Fuller Theological Seminary and so uh, much of his time is spent consulting churches on how to do missions better, to, to put that uh, frankly. And so as Emmanuel has been organizing our missions uh, committee, he reached out to Phil and asked him to come. And so we're so thankful that he's here with us tonight and he's going to be talking about how we as a local church can, can do a better job of, of supporting our missionaries. So I'm going to invite Phil to have the rest of the time. Well, thank you, Gary. But I know several people here. I'll not go through all of that. Just people that I played softball against when he was at Holmes Road. Former teachers like Joe McDaniel and Garrett. Something wrong? I'm going to grab the mic. I'm sorry. Okay. Mine is here. Can you hear me? Can you hear me on the back row? All right. Very good. I have a vested interest in talking about the extension of the gospel, not just across the seas and the mountains, but here locally. I say that because um, my family became members of the New Testament church in the 1940s when the uh, Second World War was going on. A new church started up in the opposite end of the state, about 500 miles from here in Johnson City, Tennessee. and. Uh, my father had a brother to tell him about that church that started up. And I was 10 years old when my folks began attending the Church of Christ during a gospel meeting. And my mother, who had had a Protestant background, heard the gospel three times and she said, this has to be right. So she obeyed the gospel and they never looked back. And at 12, I became a Christian. But that church um, had a meager little beginning and in 1941, it took three churches to go together, 1941, Second World War, three of them to support him with a meager salary. But he worked, and he had a good work ethic, and I had presence of mind enough to write him when he was in his 80s and thank him for that work because it made a big difference in our family. Uh, Mom and Dad died faithful. My two brothers are Christians, and I told him one of them had been an elder, and and a deacon, and that I'd preached, and so forth, and I was glad I did. You may have somebody in your life that you need to thank before they die, but well, our family was deeply indebted to him, but it was because some people reached out in a difficult time, and it made a difference in some people's lives, and I hope that'll come through again here as well. The word mission is uh, commonly used, as it's commonly used, has a lot of negative baggage to it. There are some places where it's not advisable for people to refer to themselves as missionaries. When I went to Britain, I was sent on a mission, but I didn't call myself a missionary. So many missionaries had gone out from England for years. I told them I was a preacher, an evangelist, and uh, that didn't have a lot of the baggage with it. Um, no standard English translation uses the word to describe the transmission of the Christian faith. I've checked the concordances. 
They use the word mission, the NIV does, but never in connection with preaching the gospel. But it's come down to us because it uh, comes from a Latin word, missionum, which means to send. It's referring to the sending nature. Jesus sent the apostles out. God sent Jesus. Uh, the Dutch call it this dimension, the apostolate of the church, the sending nature, the reaching out of the church. And uh, so we have that, of course, Acts 13 and 14 refers to the church at Antioch that uh, sent Paul and Barnabas out. The Holy Spirit selected them, but they sent them out. And when they finished that task, they came back and reported to the church from which they had gone out. By the way, I'll leave this PowerPoint here uh, if anybody wants to look at it. Oh, went too far. Um, the best I can, uh, the best, at best, this can refer to the sending nature of the church. But there's a danger that missions will be seen as one slice of the church's work involving only a special class of workers. And I'd like to argue against that. Um, I know there are people that we send places and they need special preparation. Not everybody is flexible enough to go to another culture that's radically different, where things are dirty and the food is not pure and uh, doesn't taste good and these people f speak a funny language. All that. There are people who can't make that kind of change and they need preparation to go. But what we're talking about in transmitting the Christian faith is something you do here in Memphis or Bartlett or West Tennessee or in Mississippi as well as going to the Ukraine and I'm glad to see your support of that work. So it's not just the task of a few. Uh, I know three historians of the early church, and they all reached the same conclusion, that the primary messengers of spreading the gospel in the first three centuries were quite ordinary people who talked about Jesus and the new kind of life they had in the ordinary affairs of life. Not special, special people. The apostles had limited time span. And then there were people who called evangelists. But the vast majority of people were won by people like themselves. And that's likely true today. The studies that I know from Western Europe and North America in the last 50 years all say that the vast majority of people who cross the bridge from the unbelief to belief cross a bridge that's made by family and friends not preachers, not television, not dropping leaflets on people. Those have a place. But the main bridge is built by quite ordinary people. And to me, the bottom line that is, we as a church need to learn how to talk about our faith. just in everyday life. That's the way the gospel is really spread. Um, we notice even here at Acts 8, the gospel spread as far as Antioch, where a great church developed. But the people who went there first were being persecuted. And they went as far as Antioch. And they didn't know any better. And they began to talk to the Gentiles as well. They were Jewish people. And um, the apostles stayed behind. Now, I don't know how many competent teachers there were in that. But the point is, they went. And then we read about Ananias and Sapphira. I haven't mentioned the passages there. We first encountered them in Acts 18 at Corinth. They've been chased out of Rome. And then and Paul stays with them because he was a tent maker like they were. Then they go over to Ephesus, and then they end up at Rome again. But the church meets in their house. His husband and wife taught Apollos the way of the Lord more perfectly. They weren't evangelists. They were people who had a family business. But they had a faith, and they talked about it. Now, if we can think of missions in those terms, I'll be happy enough. Third John, uh, verses 5 through 8, John writes and commends certain people who are going out for the sake of of the Gentiles. And he says, send them on their way. They apparently weren't sent out from somewhere else. They just went out. That's what it says. They went out on their own. But they're traveling, so help them on their way. Uh, that's the story that we see. Anybody can be a messenger. But I don't, in our thinking, it's not good to begin with the Great Commission of Matthew 28, unless we're willing to look back because this whole concept of spread of the gospel to all the nations of the earth didn't begin with Jesus' commission. Um, 
I can't remember the first time I read this passage in Galatians 3, 7, and 8, where Paul says, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Uh, he's saying, you don't have it made just because you're a Jew, because the same ground on which you're a child of God, Gentiles also can be children of God. It's a matter of faith. And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel before, beforehand to Abraham, saying, And you shall all the nations be blessed. I remember reading that years ago, thinking, what, what is this? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, first few verses of the gospel, is the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. That hadn't occurred in the time of Abraham. What's he mean? Well, I then learned how to pay more attention to the context. The good news had to do with it going to the Gentiles. The good news was that somebody of the offspring of Abraham is going to be the means by which all the nations of the earth would be blessed, not just your Jews. And so he's using the word gospel in the general sense of good news. They didn't know, the Jews didn't, how that was going to work out. But it was a part of God's long-standing plan. And we have a lot of hints of this in the Old Testament. Psalm 67 is called the missionary psalm because it calls the time when the Gentiles, the people of the nations, will come and worship God. That great prayer that Solomon prayed at the dedication of the temple in 1 Kings 8, there's this one paragraph, verses 41 through 43, where he said, And when the foreigner who is not of your people Israel pray toward this place, Hear him in heaven. Solomon stretched his arms out to pray, the first part says. Then you get to the end of it, and he says, and he got up off his knees. So he was on his knees with his arms stretched out and prayed this long prayer. And in it he says, and when even the Gentiles pray toward this place. See, all along God had that. And there was the court of the Gentiles in the time of Jesus. That's as far as they could get. But there was the court of the Gentiles. And Jesus was most unhappy with them, turned the tables over, said, you've turned it into a den of thieves. And it's written, this is to be a house of prayer for all nations. So we have a lot of those hints. And then in Paul's writings, Colossians and Ephesians, he talks about the mystery. It wasn't spooky. A mystery was a careful plan that was hidden for a while, like a military strategy. And he said, this is God's plan all along to bring the Gentiles in. And that's mentioned in Colossians and Ephesians and perhaps some other epistles as well. Now, what I'm wanting to say about this is making known the gospel of Jesus to all people of the world is a significant part of the biblical storyline. The biblical storyline, not just Matthew 28 forward, but Abraham, at least Abraham forward. So we're not talking about a, a little interest by a minority in the congregation. We're talking about something that was in God's plan, and we're all involved in it, as we'll say in just a, just a few moments. The highest purpose that the church uh, has uh, is to bring glory to God. I've heard people say, preaching the gospel is the most important thing. I don't read that in Scripture. When we have those great passages that talk about God's design in making people Christians, like Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 14, he gives eight spiritual blessings that come from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why do they do that? Embedded that are three statements, 6, 12, and 14, that we might be to the praise of the glory of His grace. I like your emphasis here on shaping people into the image of Jesus. That's a part of giving glory to God. To live God's kind of life is a way of praising God and saying, this, this is the way to live. Then that's, uh, I'm glad to see that emphasis there. So it's not just a matter of preaching the gospel. It's the result of it. I like the passage in 2 Corinthians 4. This follows the passage about we are just vessels of clay. You know, Paul said that to say, we're not really the important ones. The message is what's important. We are sort of destructible ourselves. But here he begins in <clears throat> verse 13, he says, Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what uh, has been written, I believed and so I speak. We also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus 
and bring us with you into His presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Now that's a very high motive of teaching the gospel to people. Uh, I'm impressed by people that I've seen, and I've been in nearly 40 countries, people whose lives have been changed by the gospel. We've recently moved down to Kirby Pines Retirement Facility, and after, I mean, I had a lot of books to give away, still brought four cases, but uh, some things we kept, we had to get rid of a lot of stuff. One thing I've kept, a little brass letter opener. This comes from Argentina. See, you're involved in Argentina. When I was at Highland, some of the elders and I, my wife and I, went down to Argentina because we had sort of inherited the sponsorship of a team in Buenos Aires. They started a church in the southern part of the city. And we were taking some computer things to some of the missionaries, and there was a little lady there, Yolanda, who met us at the airport along with others, and she asked if she could have those cardboard boxes after they took the computers out of them. She wanted that to put on her roof to cut down on the leaking. She was a poor woman. Husband, get her pregnant, run off. She had two sons. They were both Christians. One of them was working at night or going to school at night, working in the day to help support his mother. But that little lady went out and bought this just to give, I don't know how much or how little it costs. She's got the picture of a conquistador on the top. I'm going to keep that till I die. She said, I used to worry about food, but I don't worry now that I'm a Christian. She had had a glimpse of something. The gospel made a difference in her life. Stories like that are by the thousands. And so then she lived to praise God and to live for Him. Grace extended to her. And as a result of it, it changed her life. And she was grateful that she was a Christian. Well, there are lots of stories like that, and we need to hear those stories to remind us. When we put our money in the plate, and when we pray for people, we're wanting the gospel, the grace to extend to more and more, to increase the number of people who know and love and praise God. That's a part of the we're in. I'm going to rush through this and give time for, uh, for some questions at the end. Uh, the church is supposed to be on a mission for God in all its activities. There are several little summaries of Jesus' work. Matthew 4.23 is one of them. It mentioned that He taught in the synagogues, He preached the gospel of the kingdom, and He healed and showed compassion. He put those passages together. And that's really what we see the early church doing. They evangelized. They were to build each other up by teaching each other. Uh, till they grow to a measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, and they're supposed to engage in compassionate service. We think of Antioch as a church that sent people out. They're also the church that came down to Jerusalem and gave money to the poor saints in Jerusalem. Compassionate service is a part of the life of Christ. And the, this means that the church is on a mission for God to do what God wants done in the world. Teaching the gospel is one part of that. But our mission is broader than just that. So I notice you help Paragoo Children's Home. Those kind of things are very important. Just presence with somebody who's in trouble. We are to be a compassionate people because that's the way Christ was. And so I think we think better about evangelizing if we see that as, as a part of a bigger mission that the church itself has. It's not just a few little few people that we send out who haven't seem to have some interest in it. We're involved in it. Philippians 4, Paul thanked the church at Philippi for sending to his needs once and again. He thanked them for their fellowship in the gospel, their sharing in the gospel. In other words, he's saying, you are a part of what I am doing because you're helping me to do it. And so they sent help to him. They sent encouragement to him. Now, register, these are some of the things that we do to people. I'll give you a negative story. 
John Paul Simon went to Fried Hardeman, and uh, he went to Brazil as a single man. He was there seven straight years. His car was stolen. His house leaked. He had some health problems. And during those seven years, he got three letters from one of the elders of his supporting church. He got his check every month, never missed. But he needed some things that money couldn't buy. He needed to know that somebody back there who gives this money also prays for me and cares for me. Um, we need to give emotional and spiritual help to people who are out there working. That means a great deal. So, as we carry out this, the chief focus here, though, is on the churches bridging to distant places and how we can do that better. You know, the order in Acts was Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And by the time we get to the end of Acts, that principle was established. That they who traveled around didn't come in contact with anybody of any race or any position who wasn't a candidate for hearing good news about Jesus. That was established. The Ethiopian eunuch. You know, over in Isaiah it says the time is coming when the eunuch will have his place, but the eunuch couldn't go into certain parts of the temple, even a eunuch Jew. And when he said, here's water, what hinders me? Can, can I be baptized? I think the background of that is Isaiah where he's saying, is this for me also? Can I? An Ethiopian? A eunuch? Is this for me too? Yes, it was a him also. Um, so, what has God done among churches of Christ? I want to say just a little something about this. Just a, a part of it. To say, uh, and sometimes people ask the question, has it really been worth it, all this money we put in mission? You have, what, $100,000? I think Joe McDaniel told me tonight something like that, a good amount of money. Some people worry. It's because we don't hear enough about it. But I can assure you, God will bless it. Yes, it's worth it. And I enjoy telling stories about things like that. Most churches in Africa and India have been started by the nationals themselves. Because somebody went first and taught them and told them, you teach others. The vast majority of those churches have been started by nationals. But what we do know is encouraging to us. New Testament Christianity is in all but seven countries of the world. At least that was the calculation a few years ago by Heritage Christian University down in Florence, Alabama. They don't announce all the countries because some of them are closed and they have to be quiet about it. But uh, sometimes we're just barely there. But it means somebody has taken this seriously. But it's interesting to me to know that in Nigeria alone, there are more churches of Christ than there are in the United States. In Nigeria alone. God only knows how many there are in India because they just start up his house churches and other places. But people who are supposed to know tell me recently that they're bound to be close to two million members of the church in India alone. Two thirds to three quarters of members of Churches of Christ are outside the USA. Ought to be more than that because we have a smaller percent of the world's population. But it means somebody's been taking it seriously. It might be a little church out in Kansas. who So this is what God wants done. And so they stand behind it and, and get the job done. But this is a 1933 picture. W.B. West gave this picture to me when I first came to Memphis to teach in 1972. I asked him, who put it out? When, when it, he didn't know. I know some of the people on there. George Benson is on there and uh, J.M. McCaleb and others. Uh, he gave it to me, and so I began to do some work on it, and over a period of 20 years, uh, wrote a little biographical sketch of each one of those persons. And uh, I'll leave this copy here if you have a library. If you don't, somebody will want to read it. Interesting. Churches that were started by Jay and McCaleb in Japan in the 1890s are still going. Churches that were started in what is today Zambia, then Rhodesia, by Dal Merritt and John Sheriff are still going. And uh, John Sheriff supported himself. He was a stonemason. And there, there are wonderful stories like that. God will use people who will be vehicles. And uh, there's just a lot of drama involved in that. In Japan, there are over 100 churches. 
many of them started before the Second World War. South Korea, there are 105 churches anyway, over 600 churches in the Philippines. Got a message this week, only eight or nine in Taiwan. God alone knows how many churches there are in China because many of them have to be underground and quiet. They're being persecuted. Um, India, again, I say God alone, there are two million members. Uh, in Southeast Asia, the gospel is penetrating. Now, since the Vietnam War is over, uh, it's, it's making progress. And I'm glad people are working on that. So work by churches in Malawi, for example, started in 1906 from South, South Africa, not the USA or Canada, from South Africa. And when I was in there just a few years ago, uh, there are around 4,000 churches in that one country, likely the fourth largest church group in the country. And likely no person in the country is more than 10 miles from a congregation. I don't think we can say that in Tennessee, can we? Uh, that's saturation. Now, they need stabilizing, but somebody's been busy. They spread the gospel. A lot of people learned about Christ. Central and South America, churches in all countries except, I think, French, French Guiana, last I heard, unless somebody's gone there recently. Elders in quite a number of the churches in Brazil and Argentina and other places. There are training schools in various countries that are largely operated by local people. And uh, nationals do most of the work now. Uh, in Latin America. That's true in a number of other countries as well. I have to tell you this one little thing. Uh, a few years ago, one of my fellow elders in Murfreesboro, I was there 10 years before coming back to Memphis this last time in 2010, uh, went to the Pan American Lectures in Quito, Ecuador. Well, to come back, we went down the mountain to the seacoast to take off. Uh, when you take off on a plane in Quito, Ecuador, it is so high, they think you're never going to get off the ground. I don't know how long the runway is, but the air is thin there. So we came down, stopped at one place, and they had this group of um, people. These are Quechua Indians from high up in the Andes Mountains. And they sing with little high voices. But a, an Ecuadorian taught them the gospel. I don't know who taught him the gospel, but he knew Spanish, and he also knew the Quechua language. So he went up to teach them, and they were singing hymns. And I sat back there and just blubbered, because I thought, at least from a North American point of view, these people come from the ends of the earth, <laughs> up high up in the Andes. That was spread by a local man, but it gave them a new dimension of life. So things happen. It isn't just what happens by the people whom we send out from here, but it's what happens the next generation and the next generation as they teach people to teach the message to other people. A lot of times they have little buildings like this that they build themselves. This is in Tanzania. They build all that themselves. Where people build their own building, they buy into the work. Uh, that's one thing we've learned, that if we prop people up too much, and I know we have to do that in big cities because real estate's very expensive, but I had a friend went to school with at Fuller who told the story of some people, Midwestern people, who wanted to help a little fledgling church, a little evangelical church, somewhere in Guyana. So they got together their money and took their tools and went down there, and they found a building site, looked at the kind of church buildings that were being built, they made the decision, bought the materials, and got to work. And local people were the grunts. I mean, they carried concrete and that sort of thing. And they built it. And with great fanfare, they turned it over to this little church. Thought, now you have a nice tool, and uh, your work ought to go well. Well, they'd send reports periodically. And a couple of three or four years down the road, they got a letter, giving a report, and said, oh, by the way, the roof on your building is leaking. You need to come and repair it. See, whose building was it? Those people would never ask a question like that. If a coconut falls through it or something, they meant it themselves. That's our building. And it translates into the work of accepting responsibility for the work. Often, financial dependence creates spiritual dependence. That's a good sign. That's a good sign, a good sound, <laughs> a baby. Um, and inside, you just see people packed in, and they're learning about Jesus, and if they sing hymns in their own language, uh, it's wonderful to see that. North Africa and the Middle East as a whole 
few churches. This is a more difficult area. That's one thing we learn in missions. Some areas we know in advance are going to be difficult. Other areas we know in advance are going to be open and there'll be a harvest like there was in the Ukraine after the, the wall fell down. That was a ripe, receptive territory. India has been receptive. Western Europe as a whole is not receptive. It's hard now. It was hard in the 60s when we were in Britain. Well, I hasten on. I've already mentioned that point about the number of churches in, uh, in India and, and uh, congregations. The former Soviet Union countries, the, the cause is growing. We've had some interruption in Ukraine now, uh, as you well know. There are older churches in Western Europe some are thriving, others are lagging. Influx of immigrants is a very staggering thing now. It's breathed some new life into some of the churches in Italy. People from Ghana particularly have started churches, several of them in, the, in Belgium uh, and in the Netherlands, and I heard recently of one in Great Britain. They work up in the Twi language, uh, but they also will learn the local language. Uh, this man is a Ghanaian, Samuel uh, Tumasi Ankara. Uh, he grew up in Ghana, and when he was 12, 13, 14 years old, he began taking a correspondence course sent out from Accra, not the USA, but from Accra, and that drove him to the Bible. His father was a lay preacher in a Protestant denomination, and he went to his father and said, I, Father, I want to be baptized. He meant immersed, and uh, the church his father was in didn't immerse. He said, now, Sammy, we'll, we'll take care of this, and uh, you trust your spiritual welfare to us. Well, he was obedient, but when he grew older, finished high school, and got a scholarship to a university in Accra, and he didn't forget what he had learned. He looked up the Church of Christ, studied with him, was baptized, finished his degree, and when I was teaching for ACU, I taught an extension course in Nairobi, Kenya, and he came all the way from Ghana to East Africa to take that course on expository preaching. Well, he decided to go on with his religious education. Went to ACU and did a master's and ended up doing an EDD out at Biola. And now he is the president of Ghana Bible College. He preached at the Insawam Road Church. 1,800 members, probably the largest church outside the USA, preached there successfully for several years. Uh, he'll be in Memphis shortly. Um, Garrett knows about it, and he may tell you about it, because they're here to tell us about some work that's going on in Ghana. It's important to know that. They're trying to deepen the faith of people. Statement about Africa as a whole is, Christianity is a mile wide and a foot deep. And uh, there's a message in that. People become Christians. If we have anything to say about it as a sponsoring church, be sure and tell the workers we support, deepen their faith, deepen their faith, uh, because they won't survive if it isn't. Well, lots of stories. So what can the church do to be meaningfully involved? Keep aware of the nature and meaning of your task. Remember, this is a part of the biblical storyline. This is not a fad. This is not what a church does to be with it and to be respected. This is a part of the storyline. And small churches in Kansas and Nebraska are to be involved in that because they're Christians. Whether it's just reaching out locally or others, the gospel is meant to be spread the whole world. So keep aware. Um, Garrett needs to preach on it. Teachers need to teach it. Mission committee needs to remind us this is the will of God. People need to know about Christ. Keep that biblical or theological rootage there. Second, work with high motives. I know love is one of them. We want to see people delivered from sin. We're to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. But think of the passage in 2 Corinthians 4. We also want to increase the number of people who know and praise God and live for Him. That's a higher motive than just going and baptizing so many people. It's changing their allegiance to Jesus Christ. Three, communicate the news within the church. Pat and I know a couple. The ladies just died. They worked for many years in Belgium, supported by a church in Nashville. And uh, it was a fairly big church, and they put the pictures of the missionaries up there, but just didn't say much about it to the people. They're there. 
And they were home one time, and one of the members said, oh, yes, my name is so-and-so, and who are you? Well, I'm Ed, and this is Ann Ritchie. Oh, yes, we're glad to have you. And, uh, you know, where's your home and so forth? Well, he said, we're one of your missionaries. Our picture's right up there. See, they didn't even, didn't even know who they were. That's poor communication. People need to see, well, all of our technology nowadays, you can flash their pictures before the people. So write their names down and pray for them. Make a list in the front of your Bible. Pray for these people. We were supported by the same church for 10 years in the British Isles. They asked us to go to be a part of their plans to start a church in northwest London. And when we'd come home to Nashville and be in the home to the members, over and over and over, they'd say, Philip, it's pretty rare for us to have an assembly where somebody doesn't mention your name in prayer. I said, ah, that's one reason we made some progress. We had some good people praying for us. Not only subjectively did we appreciate that, but prayer has objective benefits as well. And so prayer is not the least thing we can do to support the work that we're supporting financially. Uh, but it needs to be communicated to people about prayer needs and what's taking place. I remember when we supported Everett Hufford in Nazareth, and the baptisms were few and far between there. It's tough territory. And they baptized a woman in the Sea of Galilee, and we had that blue aerogram. You may remember those trifold things. And uh, O'Neill Parker, who was on our missions committee, got up on Sunday and read this, said they've had a baptism in Nazareth. Oh, we needed to know that. And he took some time from our singing or my preaching or something. That was important to communicate to the church. Important. So we also need to serve the spiritual and emotional needs of those whom we support. You have, what, two families in Donetsk? Of course, they've been having some difficulty since 2014. Some way to communicate, we're praying for you. We're praying for you. We're hoping that thing's going to have a good outcome one way or another. But people need emotional support. Like John Paul Simon didn't need another check or an increase in salary. He needed to know that somebody back home understood and prayed for him. Um, of course, communication is easy nowadays with uh, uh, Duo and uh, Zoom and all of the other things that are possible. We can, we can talk to people. I have a friend in Glen Allen, Virginia, who two or three times a week works with two congregations west of Kiev. That church is, was responsible for starting them on short-term basis, going over and teaching, and they've nurtured them for 30 years. And he now is communicating with them by Zoom and uh, teaching one of those times, and the other times it's fellowship and encouragement. And he sends out a report. Very interesting. But that kind of contact for people who hear the, the bombs going over in the planes and all of that sort of thing and the sirens, it's very important for them to know some folks back in Glen Allen, Virginia, are aware of this, and they're praying for us. And we can do that. Paul was happy about the communication he had from and with the people at Philippi. It meant something to it. And several times Paul mentions people who refreshed him. That's a neat word. Refreshed him. That's a thing we human beings are capable of doing for other human beings. Refresh them. And here's the invincible Apostle Paul who is talking about how many times that this, that, and the other person had provided refreshment for him. And we can do that to the people whom we support. All right. Uh, so the, the last thing I mentioned is certainly prayer. <clears throat> now, I, I think uh, I'm going to finish with this thing, and then we'll have 15 minutes for question. Is that right? We go to 7.30? Uh, <clears throat> I like this statement by John Piper. I don't agree with him on everything theologically, but as Dr. W. B. West says, sometimes I don't agree with myself either. But uh, mil uh, missions is not the ultimate goal of the church, and I've been trying to say that. Our, our ultimate goal is to praise God, to worship God. Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. I mean, people don't know God. They don't worship Him. Worship is ultimate, not mission, because God is ultimate, not man. When this age is over 
and the countless millions of the redeemed fall at the face, on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. It's a temporary necessity, but worship abides forever. So we're talking about a temporary necessity so that we can increase the number of people who know the true and living God and who worship Him and serve Him and grow to partake of the divine nature. One passage in the New Testament, Ephesians 5.1, Be imitators of God as beloved children. Now that's sort of shattering, isn't it? Me? Imitate God? Well, obviously not in everything. We're told to follow Jesus, but not in everything. We're not a redeemer. But about their values, about the concept of love, just seeking what is best for others and so forth. Now, and what you have a missions committee that's working on uh, uh, maybe a little more focused, um, and that's appropriate. I've helped many churches start these missions committees because they need to do a lot of the legwork. They need to do a lot of the research so they can present well thought out proposals to the elders. Because uh, we have a way of making mistakes that we've known for 300 years to be the wrong way to do it. But if we don't know some of those variables, you keep on making those mistakes. But there's plenty of literature available now and uh, all sorts of uh, video and visual things that can educate their resource people I'm one of them in this area, Everett Hufford is another, who know a lot of the ins and outs about this, and we're ready to help, because this is God's work for the mission of the church. Okay, question. Comment. You want to talk a while, okay. <laughs> Garrett has a mic here. <coughs> okay. Um, check trying to uh, make my question short. Uh, I did not grow up in a church. Uh, I did not become a Christian until I was in my early 20s. Uh, so um, after going to church for all, all these years, it's not hard for me to tell that it's common for the church, the members, to have an impression about mission, which is about mission is just a part of the church. It's not a necessity. Um, so um, I didn't feel a sense of urgency or necessity, like the one Piper says, temporary necessity. So like everybody in the church has their own agenda. We have, we have our busy life, we're stressed, we have struggles. We, I mean, we have all kinds of things to do to engage. And um, I guess my question is how can we, as a church, uh, to motivate ourselves to do missions, not just, you know, we, need, we know we need to pray, we need to concern, we need to show uh, support for them, but how do we motivate the church to do that? Yes. Okay, good question. Um, part of it is, uh, I'll take that. Part of this, uh, I think you, the people who are viewing at a distance can hear, hear the question, how can we help the church to have more of a sense of an urgency and the importance of this sort of thing. Well, a lot of it is teaching. Uh, and that's not just what Garrett preaches from the pulpit. That needs to be done periodically. There were two of our brothers did a study of churches that were deeply involved over a long period of time in supporting the spreading of the gospel. And they wanted to see what do those churches have in kind, uh, in common. One thing was that their, their preacher would preach two or three times a year. I mean, you have 52 Sundays, two or three times a year, just calling the church's attention to this dimension of our work. And also in their class, and I think um, giving reports about the results of some of it, that causes people to want to do it, do it more. And I think we need more uh, emphasis on local part too. I'm, I'm very impressed with uh, an increased emphasis on disciple making that several of our churches are emphasizing, that trains all of us at, a, at our level to do something, whether it's Bible correspondence courses um, or just inviting somebody. Uh, I've read through the years uh, two or three researches that indicate eight out of 10 people say that they're likely to go to church with somebody if they were invited. Now, that's interesting. You may want to choose 
when you do that, but just bring somebody, introduce them to your friends. That's something we can all do. So to be given some practical suggestions like that and being reminded of the biblical mandate of just inviting somebody, um, they'll be forever grateful to us. So I, I think teaching, maybe having some classes on discipleship, uh, but just being reminded periodically of it uh, will sensitize it to us. And s telling some success stories. When we, someone like ourselves has succeeded in bringing a friend in. Um, one little thing, and this gets down to a very practical level. Michael Hughes preaches over in Marion, Arkansas. He lived in Virginia, and Brother Gardner and Elkins began studying with him. He had um, very, he weighed about, he's about that tall, and he weighed 300 pounds. He was very self-conscious, but uh, he finally was talked into coming to the assembly one time. He sat over and he filled out his visitor's card, and a lady sitting on the end, her name was McCullough, I remember that, saw that he was a visitor. When the service was over, she walked over and introduced herself. said, I noticed you're a visitor. I'm glad you're here today. She had no idea what that meant to him. This guy who was self-conscious, his first time to attend, and a little lady went over and said, I'm glad you're here today. Who would have thought it would have hit him like a bomb? And he said, I'm forever grateful to her. She didn't teach him anything except she cared about him. Uh, so to be sensitive to people that, we, that might be somebody you haven't met before say, are you, some, are you a member here I haven't met yet? Sure. I'm, I have that at Germantown. Uh, went up to see a guy I hadn't seen him before and I said, I, I haven't seen you before. And uh, my name was Philip. He said, no, I haven't been here before. <laughs> he was from Georgia visiting a daughter. So, but I didn't know. Okay, another question. Or can I say a few things? Just, can I say a few things? Um, you, one is there were some bookmarks that went out with our missionaries' names on them. And so this is a way to be praying for them and know them by name. Yes. Um, like Andres and Alex Gonzalez that are in Argentina that we know through Alex uh, Lopera here. Like they're on Facebook and that's how I talk to them is yeah. through Facebook. I'm sure they would love for you to add them. They've got cute kids and like they would love for you to just be interacting with them on Facebook. Oh, good, good. Um, Howard and Amy, I won't let Amy say this because you'll get emotional, I'm sure, saying this, but they're preparing to go back to China and they are begging the Oliver Creek Church to be their supporting church. And what they say is, we don't need your money as much as we need your prayers and support. Yeah. And so we're going to love them for the next year, and we're just going to love them so deeply. And when they Very go good. back, more than they need your money, they need your prayers and support. So that's one thing. If Emmanuel were in here, he would say, let me remind you that we have this email. So all, you want know, to write this down? Oliver Creek Missions at gmail.com. Com, Oliver Creek Missions at gmail.com. If you email that email address, it will go to our missionaries. So the Ukrainian missionaries that are like fleeing for their lives right now, if you email that email, they will get that message from you. Oliver Creek Missions at gmail.com. Good. And then the last thing to mention was just since you mentioned it, all the time in sermons I'm referencing like all these incredible things that are happening around the world in Asia and Africa. And so uh, there's no particular connection here to this at OC, but on May 16th at 6.30 at Harding School of Theology in the evening, they're hosting three of these uh, guys from Ghana that are going to come in and tell us about some things that are happening in Ghana. And if you're depressed about what's happening here and want to get excited about what's happening in the world, go to HST on May 16th at 6.30 and you'll, you'll be impressed. Yes. And then lastly, I'll just say, plug in our, we have rooted courses, our core eight classes that we constantly offer. We're doing the mission of God right now, yeah, working good, through good. Chris Wright's stuff. So um, that just started this past Sunday. If you're really passionate about this, come to our mission of God class on Sunday morning. So. Yes, right. Yeah. Very good. So we have opportunities here. I mean, Ford's going to build a big plant here in West Tennessee. And there's going to be a lot of influx of people coming. It's going to be work. Somebody needs to be gearing up to start a church. They did that in Middle Tennessee for the Saturn factory that brought a lot of people in at Spring Hill, Tennessee. Well, the little church at Spring Hill wouldn't have been able to absorb them all, so they started another congregation, and it's bustling. So look ahead. So Memphis, we need a church downtown Memphis. It's, uh, you know, 
we don't really know what the makeup's going to be. It's going to be multi-ethnic, uh, right downtown, building all these apartments. And uh, so we need to think about that. Think about West Tennessee. And then, of course, we need to bridge to other countries as well, like China and, uh, and other places. And we have ideas. We have statistics on these countries and how many churches we have and how the churches are getting along. That's a measure of whether people are receptive or resistant. Yes. Glad you're doing that. Uh, you're already doing a lot of what I'm recommending. Take one of those little things, put it in your Bible or on your mirror, and pray for those people. Yeah. Make it a daily thing. All right. Any other? Any other question? All right. I'll say one thing. One. There's a man named Donald McGavern. He knows us well. He was born to missionary parents in India in the 1800s um, in what ended up being the Christian church. He knows us very well. He gave a speech down at Abilene Christian in the late 1970s. He's saying, you brethren have as good a chance as any group and a better chance than most of doing effective worldwide evangelization. He gave three reasons. He said, first, you're large enough and have enough resources and personnel to do it. And of course, that counts the people who are in India and Africa and other places. We can reach out. He said, second, you have a message that will wash. He's on record as saying that the vast majority, I think he says something like 85%, of so-called mission work by Protestants is good works. It's compassionate service, but not preaching the gospel. Good works. And there's a difference. Good works are important but that's not the gospel. And so he said, you have a message that will wash. And third, he said, you have a strong doctrine of the church. He did his study and found out that if you want a more permanent presence, you start churches. You don't just win individuals here and there and keep up with them. You bring them together in groups where they can sharpen each other and pray for each other and have fellowship. So planting churches is a specific of evangelizing. That's what Paul did, and that's what we need to do, because the church is in God's eternal plan, and that's where we have the Lord's Supper regularly. That's where we're taught, where we sing to each other and to God. So we're, we're made for group life. And uh, so he said, you have a strong doctrine of the church. A lot of people do not have a strong doctrine of the church. It's just willy-nilly all over the place. But we try to follow the biblical teaching about the nature of the Christian community, the church of God, and that's a strength that we have. So at a practical level, we have a good opportunity to do good work, to make people um, aware of the gospel. Uh, one final thing. I'm going to talk to the end. I mean, <laughs> um, when I was doing my doctoral work in Fuller, I met a fellow from Japan, a Mr. Asiyama. He was a member of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. I had lunch with a bunch of Cumberland Presbyterian preachers today. Larry McKenzie and I did. And uh, I often thought, how would I like to be saddled with the responsibility of making Japanese people Cumberland Presbyterians? Uh, I read in a book, not written by us, that people in northern Brazil didn't understand why they had to be Southern Baptists. We're not, we're not settled. I mean, we're not saddled with some sort of name like that. We call it the Church of God, Church of Christ, the people of God. That's part of the baggage that we don't need to take. And, and we don't take that kind of baggage. Now, we can take other baggage, our personal baggage, and think that we have to do everything just like we did back in Memphis or some other place. Um, but we're free to, to meet those countries those people in those various countries on their own basis with the gospel. So we have a lot of strengths, and God will sustain people who will commit themselves to do His will in this regard. Well, I hope you picked up something tonight that will be helpful to you, uh, even if you want to discuss it further. And uh, as I say, this is close to my heart because I have a vested interest, and you will bless other people by your already participation in the gospel. And may God bless you as you carry it on.